Speaker, for. It is time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Good morning, uh, Speaker, and thank you. My question is for the Premier. The opening sentence of the Auditor General's blistering report says it all. The numbers from the Liberal government are, quote, not a reasonable presentation of Ontario's finances. Oh. There you have it, uh, Speaker. Auditor Bonnie Lissick revealed that Ontario's deficit this year is actually $11.7 billion, up $5 billion from the numbers wow. the Liberals just reported. Wow. They're off by 75 per cent. Wow. Next year, they're off by 85 per cent as the deficit grows to $12.2 billion. And the year after that, the Liberals understate the number by almost 100 per cent as the deficit hits $12.5 billion. The Question. Liberals' governments cannot be trusted. Mr. Speaker, sure. will the government finally come clean about the true state of Ontario's finances? Please. Please it, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, appreciate the question from the uh, the uh, opposition member. Uh, I know that the minister responsible for the Treasury Board Secretariat is going to uh, be happy to respond in the supplementary, and I've already answered a question in the public realm uh, in the, with the media today, Mr. Speaker. We thank the Auditor General for her response uh, to the uh, to the pre-election report. Um, I know that the Treasury Board Secretariat and the Ministry of Finance have been working closely with the uh, with the Auditor General of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, on a wide variety variety of issues. Um, there are issues that uh, that the Auditor General has raised in this uh, in this in her response, Mr. Speaker, that she has raised before. And these are ongoing conversations. And you know, we have worked closely with accountants. We've been very, very careful, Mr. Speaker, um, as we made the decision as a government to reduce people's electricity bills by 25 percent, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We knew that that was necessary. And we worked very, very hard to make it clear that uh, that would mean a cost. Over a period of time, we worked Thank with you. accountants to uh, to create that plan, Mr. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. The Auditor General's scathing report is an indictment of this Liberal government. Auditor Bonnie Lissick said, quote, the government did not properly record the true financial impact of the Fair Hydro Plan. She said, quote, neither the expense to pay power generators nor the interest on the funds borrowed has been included. There's billions in cash going out the door, but they're not listing it as an expense. They're borrowing money to pay the bills, but not recording the checks. So it appears there's money in the bank when there isn't any. Only Liberals think they can get away with that. Right. Mr. Speaker, why does this government present numbers that are off by 100 per cent? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, all of that debt, all of those numbers are recorded. They are all recorded, Absolutely. and there is an accounting disagreement, Mr. All Speaker. And Carry on. Mr. Speaker, all of those numbers are recorded. They are clearly laid out as debt that is being carried in the electricity system, Mr. Speaker. We made a decision that people needed to have relief on their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker, and we are spreading the cost of the, the billions of dollars of investments Absolutely. that we have made over. Okay, we're in warnings. Your outbursts are not acceptable. Carry on. A longer period of time, Mr. Speaker, and carrying that within the electricity system where it appropriately resides, Mr. Speaker, and as is done Answer. in other jurisdictions. There is an accounting disagreement that has been going on, Mr. Speaker. I recognize that. We acknowledge that, and we will work with the Auditor General. Thank you. Final supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. Well, I have to say, Speaker, that is 100 per cent wrong. It is not recorded as debt. It is recorded as an asset, something they legislated, Speaker. Only a Liberal would le legislate a debt as an asset. As if that isn't enough, the government then recorded pension revenue that wasn't theirs and listed insufficient pen pension expenses. The auditor said, quote, it should not 
have been done. She added, quote, the incorrect recording of pension revenues and expenses is an understatement of expenses. Speaker, the government's books are off by up to 100 per cent. They simply cannot be trusted. Exactly. Nothing they ever tell us should ever be believed again, and the auditor has proved that. Speaker, how can the people of Ontario ever trust one word this government says? I smell a warning. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Premier. President of the Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to respond to the Auditor General's pre-election report and start by thanking the Auditor Speaker. As an independent officer of the Legislature, the Auditor General brings a valued and incredibly important perspective to our work as government. We work closely with her and her officials, and I do want to take this opportunity to thank the outstanding officials in our government, Speaker, who have worked so closely with the Auditor in, the, in her work. Our government passed the fiscal transition Transparency and Accountability Act in 2004, Speaker, precisely because it was under a previous government. We woke up to a $6 billion surprise, right. and we have fixed right. that, Speaker. Why? Because on this side of the House, we believe that transparency and accountability are foremost in our thinking, Speaker, and that is why Answer. we are delighted to have this pre-election report today as an opportunity to once again be accountable to Ontarians. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. No person, the member from the much, Speaker. My question goes problem. back to the Premier. The auditor said the perception is created that the government has more money available than it actually does. The real deficit numbers are astounding, and they are double what they told us in this House. $11.7 billion next year, $12.2 billion the year after that, $12.5 billion the year after that, after they promised us that they would balance the budget. The deficit is out of control, and the government— Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is warned. Finish, please. They can heckle all they want, but what they're really trying to do is pull the wool over the people of Ontarians' eyes. Will the Premier come clean and admit that the real numbers in her budget are double? Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the work the Auditor General has done. And I recognize that throughout her deliberations, and we have did, and we just did speak yesterday for some time, she says this, Mr. Speaker, the pre-election report provided, which is the one that we presented just at the time of the budget, are reasonable and is cautious in its underpinning of fiscal forecast. She reaffirms that our track to back to balance is actually prudent. She recognizes that the forecast we put forward is actually cautious. And Mr. Speaker, furthermore, she is again referencing two issues that the accountants, professional accounting firms, yeah. is in dispute with the Auditor General in its reflection of those requirements. But it's fully transparent. The debt is reflected. The amount of transactions are apparent. Answer. It's there for all to be seen. And furthermore, it's reaffirmed and reinforced by the investors who are making the loans Thank in you. respect yeah. to those very issues, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, you can tell their numbers are bogus because they're playing musical chairs with who has to answer over there. What the auditor actually said is that the election report is not a reasonable presentation of Ontario's election finances. How can this government be trusted? The actual deficit will be double at $11.7 billion. The auditor is here to hold the government accountable, and they brush her aside like she's a nuisance. She's here for the good of the public. The Premier is only there for the good of the Liberal Party. So I ask, Speaker, why is this government so intent on avoiding accountability? And where is the secret hidden ledger? You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Minister. Now is attacking the public service, exactly. the accountants of this organization. 
She's attacking KPMG, who actually performs the audit for ISO. She's attacking Deloitte, who's reaffirmed the process that has been made. She's attacking, Mr. Speaker, ENY, who's audited the work of OPG. Clean audit on both cases, Mr. Speaker. Furthermore, she's attacking Deloitte. The member from Oxford is warned. Minister. He's attacking Deloitte, who is also reflected on the issues of pensions. Let me be clear. We slay the deficit based on the work we've done. We balance the budget. We have a $600 million surplus. And going. You say that, please? Please. Final supplementary. The finance minister were still at the bank, he'd be fired for what we just said. This government is intent on hiding the truth from Ontario taxpayers. When the real deficit and debt figures. I'm not going to accept that. Re withdraw, please. Withdrawn. Finish. But I'm not attacking our valued public servants. I'm not attacking outside auditors who don't have the full picture that the Auditor General does. But I am attacking this government from withholding the facts from the Ontario taxpayer by suggesting they have a $6.7 billion deficit when, in fact, it is doubled. And they are going to continue to double it over the next three years. They've not slain the deficit. They've grown the deficit. And that's going to hurt future generations, including your kids, including your grandkids, including my daughter. So where is the secret ledger? Thank you. Minister. <laughs> President, President Treasury Board, Mr. Speaker. You got it. Treasury Board. No, it's just not working. Thank you, Mr. Excuse me. The member from the PN Carlton has done something she knows I don't uh, like. And it won't happen again. President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, Speaker, I know that on days like today, when uh, tensions can be high in the House, things can be said, Speaker. But I want to join the Minister of Finance in outlining the fact that the member opposite has just cast aspersions on our professional public service, and she is. All, and I take great exception to that, Speaker. These are people who work hard. They are among the best public servants in the country. They are also working incredibly diligently with the Auditor General, Speaker. That's what we know, that's what we expect, and the member opposite should actually be uh, Answer. taking those comments back, Mr. Speaker. I will say this. The Auditor General has said that our books are prepared with an accordance of prudence Thank and you. cautious assumptions. That's what, that's what's I I stand members sit. It's a new question. The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Hospitals, because they said there was not enough money to fund our hospital in our community health sector. Is that fair? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's not the case. Uh, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that we have increased funding to hospitals uh, in every budget, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that there is a need for an increase. And last year, Mr. Speaker, we put in place $500 million more dollars for hospitals this year, $822 million, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. We have opened nurse practitioner-led <laughs> clinics around the province, Mr. Speaker. We have continually increased funding and will continue to increase funding across the system, including to home care, Mr. Speaker, including to mental health, including to pharmacare. Those are all parts of the health care system, and we are continuing to increase funding and support the needs of the population in Ontario. Well, while the Liberal government was cutting funding to our health care system and our hospital, there was something else that they were cutting. They were cutting corporate tax rate to the point where they were lower than the state of Alabama, to the point where we're talking five percentage point lower than Mike Harris' last day as Premier of this province. Why did the Premier choose to create a crisis in our health care system 
Instead of asking the richest people and the most profitable corporations to pay their fair share, you know, Mr. Speaker, this is, this question um, from the member of the third party really um, really is reflective of a fundamental difference between uh, a liberal uh, philosophy and the NDP, and that is that is, Mr. Speaker, that is that we believe we believe that industry that uh, corporations that the business world mr. speaker has a role to play in creating we creating wealth in this province the NDP will tell you that government can do everything and we can just denigrate the private sector over and over again mr. speaker yeah. we don't believe that we believe that we need to be competitive I've spent I've spent days talking to uh, governors in the United States to Congress people mr. speaker to make sure that we have a NAFTA yes, that works for Ontario and and works for Canada, Mr. Speaker, but that party doesn't think that the private sector has a role to play. Wrong, Mr. Speaker. Member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Final supplementary. Under the Liberal, just like under the Conservative, the wealthy few got a whole lot, while many people throughout Ontario were admitted into overcrowded hospital. We have reached a point where our hospitals are full, where their hallways are full, where people are being admitted anywhere that isn't a door or an exit. Why does the Premier think that it is more important to have a tax rate lower than what Mike Harris had settled for than it is to end the overcrowding crisis in our hospitals? Thank you. Speaker, you know, one of the things about government is you have to do more than one thing at a time. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, in our first budget, we increased taxes on the highest income earners in this province. Mr. Speaker, we. Finish. Exactly what the NDP says that they think should be done. We've already done it. We increased taxes on the highest income earners in this province, Mr. Speaker. But we also believe that having a competitive business sector, having businesses that can thrive and can compete with other jurisdictions around the world, we think that's important, Mr. Speaker. And when you know when I travel to China or to India, and businesses are looking at uh, increasing their footprint here, creating more jobs, Mr. Speaker, bringing that wealth to the province, yes, they're looking. For for a competitive environment. We've created that, Mr. Speaker, and we think that's important for Thank economic you. growth in this province. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour la première. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, One more time. Count on our health care system. Medicare is one of our greatest competitive advantage. But the Premier has refused at every turn to ask the wealthy few to pay their fair share in order to ensure that we have a health care system that functions the way that we know it can. Why is the Premier more interested in helping her rich connection than in ending hallway medicine? Stop. The Minister of Children and Youth Services is warned. Premier. Man, uh, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> let me just go over what I said earlier. We increased taxes on the highest income earners in this province, Mr. Speaker. We have already done that. And let's look at what has happened as a result of the competitiveness of Ontario business, Mr. Speaker. We have created in this province, in partnership with the private sector, uh, 820,000 new jobs since the recession, yeah, yeah, Mr. Speaker. Right. And of those have been created since I was the Premier, Mr. Speaker. So that's, that, has led to, that has led to the fact that we have the lowest unemployment rate in 20 years in this province, right. Mr. Speaker. You know what? That is very good for those businesses. That is very good for the people who have those jobs. But it's also good for the health care system, Mr. Speaker, because that means that we can invest in the health care system. And yes, it is a huge, huge advantage, and it's one of the reasons that people Thank come you. here, businesses come here, and those jobs have been created. I know that the Premier got into politics because of Mike Harris's cuts. But she's had 15 years to undo that damage. Actions speak louder than words. 
The Premier's action would lead us to believe that she got into politics to make life better for the wealthiest few and to cut more into our health care system that all of us depend on. Who knew? The NDP believe in fixing our health care system and asking the richest people and the wealthiest corporation to pay their fair share so that it can be done. Why is the Premier more interested in corporate giveaway to the wealthy few than in ending hallway medicine for the many? Mr. No, Mr. Speaker, um, when, I, uh, when I became the Premier, I, uh, I said to the people of this province that uh, I would work to get a better retirement security for them. I said that we would invest in education and health care, and I said that we would build infrastructure around this province. We have done every single one of those things, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. The fact, is, the fact is that I'm in politics because I believe that government exists to do the things that people can't do by themselves. Uh, I don't come from a wealthy background, Mr. Speaker. I don't know where the NDP gets that idea. I don't know where they get that notion. I know they want to play that up, Mr. Speaker. It's not true. And you know, I can I can bring out all my all my mortgage payments and all of the pictures of my small semi-detached house in North Toronto. We can we can play that game. But the fact yes, is, Mr. Speaker, I'm in politics because I believe that people need the support of government. They need pharmacare. They need they need health care, they need free tuition, and that's what we've been working on. Thank you. Please. Can you say it, please? Thank you. Final supplementary. <laughs> Speaker, we can have an Ontario where the richest people pay their fair share, where the most profitable corporation pay their fair share, and where corporate tax rates are still below national average. We can end hallway medicine. We can add 2,000 new beds to our hospital system. Can the Premier explain to everyone who has been treated in a hallway, a bathroom, a TV room, a patient lounge, why is it more important that she helps the few at the top rather than give people the, dig the dignity and the care they deserve? Mr. Speaker, we need people to be able to find jobs in this province. We need people to be able to look after themselves and their families. And, and having a job, having a decent job, is a is a really important part of that. Of course, there are things that government has to do, and we recognize that, which is why we have stepped up year after year to put those supports in place, and we know that there's more that we have to do. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, government has to do more than one thing at a time. We have to invest in our health care system, which yeah. we are doing, and we have to have a competitive business environment, Mr. Speaker. Our unemployment rate has dropped to 5.5 per cent, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. It's the lowest level in two decades, Mr. Speaker. For the past three years, Ontario has led all G7 nations when it comes to economic growth, Mr. Speaker. That's a good thing. Now, the yes, NDP sir. may not think that's a good thing. They may no. think that's a bad thing. The fact is that's jobs, that's a high quality of life for people of this province, and that's services that we can deliver because of that trust. Thank you. No question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This government had been warned for well over a year that what they were doing with our finances was not right. The Financial Accountability Office warned that because of the hydro scheme, MPPs should obtain assurance from the auditor that the province's accounting meets the public se sector accounting standards. They were that worried, Speaker. The FAO also stated that beyond this year, expect a quote, significant increase in the budget deficit due to growing impact of the Fair Hydro Plan. They knew, Speaker, the government knew that they were jeopardizing Ontario's fiscal position. They were told over and over, Speaker, why does this Premier and this government think they're above the rules? Question. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite makes reference again to the principles of accounting, which I'll leave to the accountants, the Deloitte's, uh, KPMG, ENY, all of whom have prepared and, and provided for the structure that we have before us and affirmed by them. And the member opposite talks about the concerns that would happen with the investment community. Well, Mr. Speaker, it was them who was actually 
proposing and investing in these very issues. Furthermore, DBRS, a rating agency, just confirmed our AA rating as stable, Mr. Speaker, in light of all of these situations as well. We're moving forward with the appropriate accounting principles that's approved by world-renowned accounting firms, Mr. Thank Speaker. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. The government didn't listen to the Financial Accountability Office, and now they won't listen to the Auditor General. This is from the Auditor. Quote, it is clear the government's intention in creating their accounting to handle the cost of the electricity rate reduction was to avoid affecting its fiscal plan. She's on to them. Quote, the intention was to avoid showing a deficit in the province's budgets and consolidated financial statements and to likewise show no increase in the provincial debt. Quote, and by and the way they finance it could, quote, cost Ontarians four billion more in interest costs. So, Speaker, why is this Premier and this government putting the province's finances in jeopardy just to cling to a power? President Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, at the core of this issue, and again, we thank the Auditor General for her report, Speaker, is an issue about uh, um, accounting differences of opinion, Speaker. And uh, the IESO is a rate regulated agency, Speaker, and thus uses rate regulated accounting. The change in the IESO's accounting practice has, has done a couple of really important things, Speaker, and I'll get to those in a quick second. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Before I get to that, Speaker, I just want to remind the member opposite of a couple of important things. Number one, we took $1.5 billion, Speaker, off the tax base and we put it onto the rate base, Speaker, which we saw as Answer. a very important issue regarding fairness. Um, you know, the, the, the ISO accounting practice that we adopted has eliminated a second set of books, has brought greater transparency to $17 billion worth Thank of transactions, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member for Timiskamy Cochrane. Thank you. My question is to the Premier, and first of all, I'd like to thank the Auditor General for her work on behalf of the people of Ontario. And today she reported that the government's pre-election that the government's pre-election report is, quote, not a reasonable presentation of Ontario's finances. And that's partly because the government is using a complicated private financing scheme to keep billions of dollars of hydro debt off the government's books. Not only does this scheme waste $4 billion for no other purpose than to hide this debt, it clearly violates public accounting standards as the government knew it would. Why is the Premier hiding the truth about what its $40 billion hydro, scheme, hydro boring scheme I I've ruled on this. I'm not accepting it. The member will withdraw. I withdraw. Thank you. You may finish your question. Why is the premier? Um, <laughs> why is the premier involved in this 40 billion dollar hydro scheme, which will cost the public even more money? President of the Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Speaker, uh, thank you very much uh, to the honourable member for his question, and I, I think it's important, Speaker, to just remind that this pre-election report really is a, um, an important uh, important opportunity for the Auditor General to give us some very uh, very important advice, Speaker. Um, the uh, the accounting practices that the member opposite talks about have done some really important things for our economy and for uh, for rate uh, payers, Speaker, because this change in the ISO's accounting practice has eliminated a second set of books that was previously kept, has brought greater transparency transparency to $17 billion worth of transactions, and furthermore, is consistent with the accounting practices of IESO's predecessor, the OPA. Um, we respectfully disagree with the Auditor General on this, Speaker. We made a significant policy decision to lower the cost of energy for Ontarians, Speaker, Answer. and that is the decision that will stand. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks again to the Premier. The Premier's $40 billion hydro boring scheme does not permanently lower bills for Ontarians. Over the long run, it will add 
$40 billion in hydro debt and interest onto bills which will have to be repaid once again by the people who use hydro. And the government is needlessly wasting $4 billion on private financing scheme whose sole purpose is to keep that debt off the government's books. Instead of violating public sector accounting standards, why won't the Premier just tell the Ontario public the truth that their hydro bills have not really gone down, but over the long run will skyrocket higher than ever before? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to go back to the premise of this report, Speaker, and remind uh, the member opposite that uh, the Auditor General actually, in issuing her report today, underscored the fact that our government has prepared our books with a degree of prudence that she underscores as being extremely important. So that's, that's an important piece of context. You know, Speaker, when the public accounting standards, as Deloitte pointed out, are silent on the question of how to account for the impacts of rate regulation, it is appropriate for a public sector entity and this is their opinion, Speaker, to select accounting policies that would result in the recognition of the impacts of rate regulation. This, again, Speaker, is, a, is an area of disagreement with the Auditor General. Uh, we have another area of disagreement with her as well on pensions. We are pleased to have a report today. We, res we respect Answer. her opinion, and uh, we, again, um, you know, uh, underscore the fact that this is an act of transparency on our part to publish this pre-election report, something that Ontarians previously didn't have. Thank you, Mr. New Speaker. Question, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Minister, Ontario's building code establishes standards for construction in the province. One of the things the building code speaks to is the construction of buildings with wood frames and materials. Building with engineered wood products is structurally comparable to concrete and steel buildings in strength. It, it stores carbon and lessens the impact of climate change. It lowers greenhouse gas emissions by not using energy-intensive materials, and it can lower building costs with cost-effective materials and shorter construction time. Mass timber structural framing systems have high strength-to-weight ratios and are dimensionally stable, and are quickly becoming the systems of choice for sustainably-minded designers. I know that the Minister of Municipal Affairs has been advocating for wood construction for a number of years, so, Minister, could you please tell us a bit Question. about the work you, that you and your ministry and the government have done on wood-based construction. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Speaker, thanks to the member for the question. In 2012, Speaker, I did introduce a private member's bill to allow for six-story wood frame construction in Ontario to increase the use of wood in Ontario's construction industry by requiring its use in provincially funded buildings. The goal was achieved in January 2015 when the building code was updated to support the construction of mid-rise wood frame buildings up to six stories. I should also mention, Speaker, that mass timber buildings over seven stories could also be built under our current building code. However, projects were not being brought forward. In an effort to further support the use of wood in building construction last year, we released the tall wood reference, which will assist architects, engineers, building and fire officials and developers in the development of safe alternative solutions for taller wood projects. We also co-funded with the federal government to test the performance of mass timber building systems. Speaker, the research and tests that support tall wood Question, buildings uh, is answer. funded through the Climate Change Action Plan funding which the leader of the party opposite has promised to cut. These projects will provide valuable transferable knowledge that can be used in Thank future you. tall wood construction projects. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we all know how important the forestry sector is here in Ontario. Forestry is a way of life for hardworking Ontarians across the province with $15 billion in revenue and 172,000 direct jobs relying on the sector. Mr. Speaker, wood products use less energy than steel or concrete and produce fewer emissions. Wood products also function as carbon storage units, storing carbon that would otherwise be emitted into our atmosphere. Speaker, I also know that tall wood buildings are an effective, efficient, and sustainable way to build communities and help support Ontario's important forestry sector. So, Minister, how does the Mass Timber Program benefit Ontarians? Thank you, Minister. The Speaker, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the member for the Ottawa South for his great question. And I'm very happy to talk about the Mass Timber Program, which promotes the use of mass timber in construction and help reduce the effects of climate change. 
This program offers direct benefits to the people of Ontario, particularly people from the north, because it includes the creation of new jobs in the forestry and also in construction. And also it advances low carbon building science, which is important for our innovation in the sector. So I'm very pleased to stand here and talk about four tall wood projects that have been funded through our cap and trade program, a program that uh, the party opposites wants to eliminate. These four programs are the Academic Tower at the University of Toronto, yes, an sir. Academic Tower at uh, George Brown College, an office space in Toronto, condominiums in North Bay. Ce sont tous des projets Thank you. These are all innovative proje projects. The member from the Thank you very much, Speaker. My question goes back to the Finance Minister. Just like at Enron, the secret hidden ledger was finally revealed, and when it was, the real deficit and the deficit figures are now accounted for. The net debt per Ontario resident is $23,670 per person. Let me bring you back to 2003 when they were brought into office. It was only $11,324. That figure is going to raise by $24,900. 60 per person next year and $26,240 per person the year after that. So this government is leaving my daughter and the next generation with an unsustainable amount of debt that is going to hurt our very core and valued public services. So I want to know why is this government, including that Premier, content with leaving our children over $26,000 worth of debt because of their mismanagement? Mr. Speaker, um, I got three kids of my own, and I want to leave them with opportunity in the future. And let me be clear: the member opposite is talking about one side of the ledger. There's something else that's extremely important here, extremely worth noting, and that is Ontario is indeed one of the largest subnational economies in the world, Mr. Speaker, over $800 billion. And we're going to be up to a trillion soon, Mr. Speaker. And it's that strength of our economy, that work, that is also important in that calculation. And you take into account the degree of debt as a percentage of that overall value. The people of Ontario have a huge net worth, Mr. Speaker, of close to $40,000 each. My children are going to benefit because of the investments we make in transit, in schools, Sir. in hospitals, in, in, in the economic growth. They'll have opportunity. They're denying them that right. Thank we'll you. continue to invest in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. What we really are is the largest subnational debtor in the world, Speaker. And that minister over there maybe have seventy-eight thousand dollars kicking around to pay for his kids' share. But most Ontario families, the people of Ontario, don't have an extra eighty thousand dollars kicking around to pay for their mismanagement. A child born under the Liberal government immediately will owe twenty-six thousand dollars thanks to that minister i care about the future i care about my daughter i care about the kids in our hockey team i care about the pages but they are putting all of that at risk with unsustainable and reckless spending i want to know from the minister is he okay with saddling every single child born in 2018 with twenty six thousand dollars of additional debt because i can tell you me vic fidelli and doug ford certainly aren't you say that, please? You say that, please? thank you Minister. Mr. Speaker, in 40 years, there have been only eight balanced budgets, three of them by the Conservatives, the rest by us. Oh. Mr. Speaker, the largest deficit in Canadian history was over $50 billion by the Conservative government, Mr. Speaker, not by anybody else. Furthermore, this is all about choice. The member opposite is talking about what they choose to do. We have no idea because they have no plan, but we know what they are going to do. They're going to cut. 
We want to support child care for people, mental health and addictions, more supports for hospitals, more supports for our seniors, more supports for our children and our students, Mr. Speaker, to put them at their best going forward in our future. We're investing in those programs. They are going to cut those programs. They're putting at risk the future of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We're fiscally strong, and we're going to continue to be strong because the people of Ontario deserve that, Mr. Speaker. You say it, please. You say it, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This is a question to the acting premier. After 15 years of neglect and empty promises on child care investments from Liberal governments, it is clear for families in Waterloo Region that change for the better can't come soon enough. This week, I spoke to Bonnie Zare, who is the executive director of Emanuel at Brighton Child Care, and she told me the story of one family new to Waterloo whose parents, both parents, have finally found work, but they can't find child care. They cannot find affordable, accessible child care in a not-for-profit setting anywhere in Waterloo Region, like 80 per cent of the families in this province. The only thing that they can find are wait lists. They've been on Emanuel's growing wait list for three months. There are 600 families on that list, and staff must tell families that the wait list is two years long. This family has no support network in the region, and their professional success and quality of life are directly affected and connected to finding affordable childcare. Question. Does the Premier understand how stressful and how challenging it is to find quality childcare in the province of Ontario? Thank you. I can bring it. Speaker, Minister of Education and Minister Responsible for Early Years and Child Care. Minister Responsible for Early Years and Child Care. And Minister thank you, Education. Mr. Speaker. And I actually want to thank the member opposite for asking this very important question, because absolutely we recognize that we need affordable, accessible child care in this province. And that's why the Premier tasked me to make sure that we are on track. So here's what we're doing. We have been working diligently and tirelessly over the last year and a half to make sure we're building the foundation, creating more spaces, creating more uh, 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 actually affordable spaces and ensuring that we are on track to free preschool child care for families of children. And so, Speaker, let me just tell you about some of the things that we've been doing. We're planning on investing $2.2 billion over three years to ensure that there will be free yes, child sir. care for preschoolers. That will save families an estimated $17,000 per child, and that's in addition to what they'll be saving in full-day kindergarten, which Thank is $6,500 per child. Thank you. Speaker, after 15 years, after too many photo ops and too many child care centres across the province, why should families believe that this Liberal government will— Stop the clock, please. I believe there are some members on this side that have been warned. We can add to that list. And after a warning is a naming. Finish, please. Thank you. We hit a nerve. Why should families believe that Liberals will take action to deliver on childcare? Speaker, families who are excited to finally qualify for subsidies are only disappointed again when they learn that there are no childcare spaces to access. We are the childcare waitlist of wonder of Canada. Congratulations. Speaker, we have a plan that invests in ECEs who are on the front line. We have a plan that ensures that families will have high quality spaces because we are committed to not for profit care. We have a plan that invests in creating spaces because you can't build a system without capital funding, and our plan will make childcare free for those who need it most because that's where the return on investment is. Why has your government still not created a plan based on needs of the families in the province of Ontario after 15 years? So, Mr. Speaker, uh, let me just give you a quick uh, a summary of some of the things that we're doing. We're investing in childcare, $1.4 billion in operational funding, $1.6 billion in capital funding. What does that mean? We're creating spaces. We committed to create 100,000 spaces over five years. We're actually not just on track, but we're ahead of it. What have we created so far? So we're on track to create 31,000 more spaces. Those are the photo ops that the member opposite is talking about. 
talking about. We're actually going out there and announcing the spaces. And 60% of the spaces that we're creating now are subsidized. So we're actually increasing the number of spaces that are subsidized. But, Speaker, that's not all. We're also building towards the future, and that's where free preschool childcare comes yeah. in. As of 2020, families yes, will be getting free preschool childcare. The NDP plan sounds good, but apparently Gordon Cleveland says it's completely unrealistic. Oh. They're not building the foundation. We're building that solid foundation, Thank you. recognizing the workforce. Thank you. you say it, please. New question to member from Guelph. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, it's safe to say that the way people move around our communities is constantly changing. I know one change that has caught my attention is the growing interest in and demand for active forms of transportation. This demand for improved cycling infrastructure in particular is significant, and I consistently hear from my constituents in Guelph who are looking to government to make investments that will make cycling a safer, more convenient way to get around. I also hear it firsthand from my daughter, Allison, who just happens to uh, own a bike shop in Bracebridge. So, Speaker, I know that this month, Mark the annual bike summit. Can the minister please share the update Question. that was provided at the bike summit on the steps our government is taking to support cycling around the province? Yep, thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Guelph and also welcome her daughter, uh, Allison, from Ecclestone Cycling Shop in the Members Gallery today. And yes, I was very pleased to enjoy it, to join Ontario Cycling Community a few weeks ago to celebrate the progress that we've made towards creating a more bicycle-friendly Ontario, sure. but also to look at the significant work that remains ahead. After releasing our first Cycle On Action Plan, we didn't slow down. In my time as the PA to the Minister of Transportation, I was actively involved in the cycling file. And now as Minister, I see we've made remarkable progress. Mm -hmm. Much of this work has culminated into the Cycle On Action Plan 2.0, which I was so pleased to present at the Bike Summit. The updated action plan includes 37 proposed action items and five key strategic directions, including Answer. designing health the active, prosperous communities, improving cycling infrastructure, making highways and streets safer, promoting cycling awareness and creating behavioural change and increasing cycling tourism. Thank you. Supplementary. Yes, thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister for her answer. It's clear that we are taking an active approach to meet, meet the needs of the cycling community here in Ontario. I was very pleased to announce recently that our government's new Ontario Municipal Commuter Cycling Program is providing Guelph with nearly $1.2 million to support local commuter cycling projects. I can't wait to see the new bike lanes that will happen in Guelph, but of course I know that if the Conservatives are elected there won't be any more of this because it's funded by our carbon pr program and climate change. But Minister, yeah. would you can, uh, uh, tell us some more about your important Important initiatives like the new Cycle On Action Plan. The new plan is sure to build on our government's ongoing collaboration Question. with cycling advocates. And could, if you could uh, elaborate on what that action plan contains, we would definitely appreciate the thank details. You. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to again thank the member from Guelph for her ongoing support of the cycling community. Our action plan includes 37 unique action items, including our commitment to a province-wide cycling network. The fact is that our government has and continues to be a strong partner for the cycling community. With advocates like the President of the Treasury Board at the table, this shouldn't come as any surprise. We've made consistent investments, including bike rooms at GO stations, bike lockers at carpool lots, and introducing a safe cycling education fund. While our Liberal government remains committed, we know that the Conservatives would scrap the cap-and-trade program, which this year alone is supporting commuter cycling projects in nearly 120 municipalities across the province. Wow. This is a party opposite with a leader who, as a councillor, consistently spoke out Answer. against cycling projects in the City of Toronto. Unlike the party opposite, we know investing in cycling is a right move. It supports Thank our you. environment and creates sustainable—
No question, the member from Thorn Hill. Yeah. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Today, an advocacy group of medical students, hashtag spots for docs, are protesting at Queen's Park. They're protesting the state of physician services planning, specifically the low ratio of medical graduates to residency spots. Mr. Speaker, 800,000 Ontarians are without a family doctor, while many medical school graduates are unable to practice medicine. In 2015, this government drastically cut residency positions. Ontario taxpayers invest $200,000 for each student, yet they are blocked from finishing their training. Instead of creating permanent residency positions, the Ministry of Health announced temporary residency spots, which only help presently unmatched medical graduates. Will the minister please explain why she's turning her back on future medical school graduates? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, thank you so much. And uh, of course, uh, our government recognizes how important it is to match the physician supply to the need across Ontario. And as a physician, a former medical student, I still remember the stresses not only of medical school, but of the matching process that I went through many years ago. So we fully understand the issue. Uh, we do know that between 2003 and 2016, we have a large supply of physicians practicing in Ontario, some additional 38%. But we do understand that there are challenges for new medical graduates, and this is why our government is funding more residency positions for medical school graduates who have completed their undergraduate training at an Ontario medical school. This is a pan-Canadian problem, and so we're working with our medical schools to create more specialized res residency spots. Answer. Obviously, this upcoming school year, everyone will find a spot. Everyone who is not right. matched will be offered a residency position. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you again to the minister. This government's plan is a band-aid solution which only addresses the issue in the short term. A desperate attempt by a desperate government to quickly deal with a crisis of their own making. What is needed is a long-term, comprehensive strategy to plan for all medical resources across Ontario. The hundreds of students that are right now protesting in the rain took time away from their study and clinic work to advocate for better health care for all Ontarians. Will the minister commit today to support the recommendations of Bill 18, the Careers in Medicine Advisory Committee Act, and strike a panel of medical experts to take the first step towards a comprehensive plan for medical resource planning in Ontario? Here, here. Speaker. Uh, the issue that I think is uh, really important in terms of what we have uh, announced this year is that we will be requiring these new residents in these new additional positions uh, to provide a return of service to underserviced communities across the province. And so we will be specifically targeting those areas where we know we need more specialized service, such as emergency medicine, pediatrics, and psychiatry. And so this investment will also ensure a stable supply of physicians in communities across the province. And of course, we're going to continue to work uh, across the country uh, with our medical schools to ensure that the matching process is enhanced as we go forward. And certainly, we're going to be reviewing the outcomes of this particular year's matching process yes, and work with relevant stakeholders and ensure that we have every success on the part of the graduating physicians and on, on the you. part and on behalf of the people of Ontario. New question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, yesterday a report was released recommending that large-scale EQAO testing continue for every Ontario student in grades 6 and 10. Speaker, 67 per cent of Ontarians agree with New Democrats that EQAO census testing is not working for students. People for Education points out that 20 years of EQAO results have done nothing to close the education equity gap. Instead, EQAO allows schools to be ranked against one another, creating winners and losers yep. and primarily benefiting real estate agents at a cost of millions of dollars that could be used in the classroom. Will the acting premier listen to parents, educators, students, trustees, education experts and others? Instead of making changes to EQAO, will she commit to Question. eliminating EQAO altogether? Yes. Speaker, Minister of Education and Minister responsible for early years and childcare. Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to answer this question. I, you know, Mr. Speaker, I find it interesting that the party opposite is so interested in education now, when actually in their 2014 uh, platform they had no mention of education. And I just want them to know that this, on this side of the house, we have been making uh, investments in our education system uh, for many years, uh, and and uh, these investments are ones that I'm proud of. Mr. Speaker, our world is rapidly changing, and our classrooms need to keep up with that change. Absolutely, we need to make informed decisions, and we need to ensure that where there are gaps and challenges in the system, that we are on top of them so that we can give our system and our educators and our students the supports that they need. That is why we commissioned an independent review of Ontario student assessment and reporting, yes, led sir. by the highly respected Dr. Carol Campbell and her five advisors. The review's recommendations suggest that the status quo is no longer working well enough, and I'm happy Thank to you. explain more in these. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, ask any parent, and they will tell you. They look to report cards and teacher yep. feedback to let them know how well their child is doing, not EQAO results. Parents understand that teaching to narrow tests in literacy and numeracy takes up too much te teacher focus, creates undue stress on students, and diverts resources away from student learning. Speaker, this Liberal government has had 15 years to address long standing concerns about EQAO. They've had 15 years to replace EQAO with an effective random sample testing model that will provide a true check on the Ontario curriculum while helping to identify the supports that students need. Is this government's newfound interest in changing EQAO another last-ditch attempt to try to win back support before Question. the June election? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to remind the member opposite that we're actually the ones that embarked on this review, and it is a comprehensive review. I also want to ensure that the member opposite has actually read what the recommendations were, and if she had, she would know, actually, that the advisors and uh, Dr. Carol Campbell actually talked about Minister. Uh, she actually made a real distinction between what was happening in the classroom and also EQAO. And in fact, she said that what was happening in the classroom was extremely important and was actually Answer. a very good way forward in terms of assessing and, and, uh, and actually recommended that we strengthen classroom assessment and uh, reporting and that we do further consultations on EQAO. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Senior Affairs. Speaker, I'm sure the Minister is aware of the good news that seniors like myself are living longer and in better health than ever before. With this comes... With this, comes, with this comes new challenges for how our government can provide the necessary care and support for the rapidly growing demographic. One of those challenges is social isolation, which can affect the mental and physical well-being of those without the opportunities to engage in their community. Among the many wide-ranging initiatives and program commitments that were announced in last year's Aging with Confidence Action Plan was our commitment to expand the successful senior Community Grant Project. With a focus on community-oriented solutions Question. to keep seniors active and engaged, this program has already supported over 1,600 uh, projects. Speaker, would the minister tell this House about the expansion of the Seniors Community Grant Program? Mr. Responsible, uh, Minister of Seniors Affairs. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Barrie for the question and wish her many, many, many years of aging with confidence here in Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, a few weeks ago, I was, along with the member from Ottawa Centre, I was in Ottawa 
at the Good Companion Centre, where I had the pleasure of announcing this year's successful project applicants for the Seniors Community Grant. Our government is investing $4.1 million, Mr. Speaker, to support nearly 250 projects. One project in particular that I'm very excited about is something we call Seniors Without Walls. It's going to allow us to create virtual uh, seniors community centers across Ontario to ensure that our seniors are not socially isolated and have a place to make friends regardless Answer. of geography. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for telling this House about our commitment to investing in programs and initiatives aimed at reducing social isolation. I'm glad that our government is providing resources and supports to foster existing innovative programs across this province, allowing them to benefit even more from, for this, from the seniors of Ontario. However, that's not all, Speaker, as I believe that just last week our government announced yet another way how it is reducing social isolation and keeping our seniors engaged and socially connected with their communities. Last week, the Minister of Seniors Affairs and the member from Brampton West were at Villa Polonia in Brampton, where they announced the 40 new seniors' active living centres. Can the Minister of Seniors Affairs please inform this House about this expansion? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and you can see that our government is continuing to invest in speakers every week. We have something to announce for our speakers, and yes, for our seniors, sorry. And yes, the member from Barry is correct. Last week, I did have the pleasure of announcing, Mr. Speaker, 40 more seniors active living centers. That brings the total to 303 total. Thank you. And so, Mr. Speaker, this means we have 40 more centres where thousands of seniors across Ontario have a place to come together to meet friends, make new friends, learn new skills, and continue to lead lives of purpose. I'm really proud of this announcement, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your question, the member from Niagara West Glanbrook. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Recently, Niagara Regional Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Andrea Feller, reported the 155 suspected opioid overdoses in 2016 soared by 225 per cent in 2017. That means that Niagara Emergency Medical Services paramedics responded to 520 suspected overdoses in 2017. The opioid crisis is hurting families and youth across Niagara, and my question is, uh, what is the government doing to respond to this crisis? Good. Thank you, Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, of course, uh, uh, the opioid crisis is something that was well recognized by our government uh, over the last year, and certainly the numbers are alarming. And uh, I'm very pleased that the Associate Medical Officer of Health is informing the community as to the situation uh, in uh, Niagara region. And so this is, of course, precisely why we are investing over $222 million over three years to combat the opioid crisis in Ontario, especially uh, in the issue of expanding harm reduction services. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity to visit the Queen Street Community Health Centre, where they offer a safe injection site. This is one of many that we're introducing and opening across the province. They're doing excellent work. They're saving lives. At the same time, of course, Answer. they're referring people for counselling. I'll elaborate in the supplementary. Good supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And my question is back to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Unfortunately, I, I would say that uh, some of the action the government has taken has not done enough in, in the Niagara region. Uh, Sandy of Beamsville recently spoke of her son, Scott, who played hockey, uh, took karate, took swimming lessons, and ran marathons. At one time, he owned his own house, had a beautiful fiancé and a bright future, she said. Then fentanyl got its claws into him, and he lost it all. Speaker, how does the minister plan on ensuring mothers like Sandy do not have to bury their children because of this government's lack of action on the opioid crisis? Minister. Our uh, initiative is absolutely clear in terms of what we're doing. Uh, we've established an opioid emergency task force. We're making naloxone kits available to pharmacies, public health units, police fire services. We're, we're working with stakeholders. I had an extremely useful conversation yesterday at the safe injection site with the stakeholders and the frontline workers. I guess the question is, what on earth are you going to do on the other side of the house? As far as we know, Doug Ford is going to close safe injection. The 
Minister of Education, on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd actually like to correct my record when it comes to childcare. I want to point out that in the 2018 budget, Ontario is now investing a historic $1.9 billion in operating funding for early. Thank you. Member from Oxford on a point of order. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, introduce um, an intern from my office, Claire De Bruyne. This is her last week here at Queen's Park, and I'd like to thank her for the hard work she's done for us in the last 10 weeks and wish her a good trip back to work. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion of this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. Call on the members. This will be a five minute bell.
all members, please take your seats. On March 28, 2018, Mr. Susan moved second reading of Ms. Wynn, uh, seconded by Ms. Wynn that this House approves the general budgetary policy of the government. All those in favour, please rise one, and one at a time and be recognized by the chair. Mr. Caesar. Mr. Caesar. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Wynn. Mr. Wynn. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Jassic. Mr. Jassic. Mr. Jassic. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame uh, Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Marini. Mr. Marini. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dahmer. Mr. Vernio. Mr. Vernio. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Mar. Mr. Mar. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame DeRosier. Madame DeRosier. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. What? Here you go, Potsy. All those opposed, please rise for another time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Ostra. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Shimanta. Mr. Shimanta. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. The ayes are 48, the nays are 32. <clears throat> the ayes being 48 and the nays being 32, I declare the motion carried. The President of the Treasury Board on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, correct my record on something I said earlier. I said that to support a 25 percent reduction of electricity bills, we took $1.5 billion off the tax base and put it onto the rate base. What I meant to say is the opposite, Speaker. We took $1.5 billion off the rate base and put it onto the tax base. Thank you, Speaker. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.